Good morning, everybody. Um, this is a workshop on mustards, and it will be done by Colleen Young, my colleague, and myself, Linda Driver. We are master food preservers in San Joaquin County, California. And I am glad to see everybody join us. Um, I always like to ask people somewhere along the line in the chat to put in where you're from, because uh, and I and I hate to say it, but my favorite place was in the news this summer as because they were part of the Canadian wildfires fires. But my my favorite place from for somebody to join us once was Yellowknife, Northwest Territories, Canada, which was um, 600 miles from the North Pole. <laughs> I thought that is that is outreach. So anyway, today we're going to talk about mustards. But before we do that, um, Colleen is going to talk about food safety a bit because that is part of our mission and you get it whether you like it or not every time you talk to one of us. So Colleen, go for it. You're muted, Colleen, I think. I am. There we go. There go. Good morning and welcome to our presentation this morning. Um, I hope you get some good information. I'm going to talk briefly about uh, food safety. Um, you know, we do this, if you've, if you've joined us before, you know this is uh, something that we do as master food preservers. We want people to be safe when they're uh, doing uh, anything with food, and that's something we all do every day. Um, I, why food safety is important, uh, that's because one out of seven people get sick every year. And, um, you know, a lot of times we will uh, blame that on stomach flu. Uh, however, there is no such thing as stomach flu. So basically what we're getting is um, a little food poisoning from something. Food poisoning can happen right away after you eat something, or it can happen a couple of weeks later. So sometimes it's hard to uh, know what we ate that is disagreeing with us. Um, about 3,000 people die every year from food poisoning, um, which can lead to long-term illnesses, uh, uh, chronic arthritis, brain and nerve damage, kidney failure. There's a lot of things that we can get besides that uh, stomach flu. So that that's why it's very important for us to emphasize. Um, von, we have vulnerable groups and that is pregnant women, older adults, young children and people that have weakened immune systems. So uh, if we're taking care of young children or older adults, uh, pregnant women or people that have weakened immune systems, we need to be even more uh, aware of what we are serving those people. If you stop to think about how and where contamination of food happens, you think about a garden. Think about planting that food. Think about the people working in that um, food. How about the workers when they're picking the food? Uh, maybe the buckets that they're putting the produce in isn't clean. If you buy your food at a, a farmer's market, and I love a farmer's market, Think about how many people come through and touch that food before you pick that one because it looks the best to you. How about when um, people are trucking it? My husband was a farmer. I know that when they're picking grapes or cherries or whatever else they're picking, they're putting it in a bucket and they're dumping that into a bigger bucket. So, you know, all of that stuff is not cleaned every time. 
So it takes a very little amount of, of uh, contamination to spread. So even if you buy your food at the grocery store, you know, I can't believe that all of you picked up the apple, the first apple you touched. You know, you don't touch anything unless you pick it up. You know, I, I want to make sure that avocado is is getting a little soft or those tomatoes aren't mushy. So you, you need to take into consideration how many people have actually touched that. And it, this may be news or new information to you, but produce is the number one food contaminant. They have, uh, that's because so many people have contact with that before you do. Now, uh, meat and poultry uh, cause the most death in, in food illnesses, but produce is what um, has the most contamination. And that's because when you think of a head of lettuce, you know, you've got all these leaves uh, things get down in between the leaves, uh, people touch it. So that's where we need to really be careful about making sure that we clean our produce. So any food actually can be contaminated and you can't always smell or see it because bacteria is causing that food poisoning. So if you are the least bit in doubt, just throw it out. Um, we need to make sure that we handle our food safely. And the things to remember are we need to clean our surfaces. We need to separate our foods into um, fruits and vegetables, things that are cooked, things that won't be cooked, our meats, we need to make sure that our temperature is correct, whether we are chilling it in the refrigerator or if we are going to cook it. So those are very important things that I don't remember even considering when I was younger. So we need to make sure that we wash our hands with soap and water, you know, like a surgeon, and we need to clean our surfaces uh, a good thing to use is if you put uh, a quarter teaspoon of, excuse me, a half teaspoon of um, bleach in a quart of water and spray that on your counters, just let it sit. It will evaporate. Don't rinse it off. And that will help sanitize your countertops. Um, we want to rinse our produce. We don't want to soak it because uh, water will get through the skin in most of the produce that we have, but we want our um, produce to be clean, even if we are going to peel it. Because if I pick up a dirty orange and I don't rinse it off, I just peel it, that dirtiness or that uh, bacteria is now on my hands. So as I'm peeling it, I am removing the, the peel, but I am touching the edible fruit at the same time. So by separating it, when we buy our, our groceries, we want to put our fruits and vegetables in a bag separate from meats. Because you're go going to get uh, cross-contamination between those. You want to make sure that you use separate cutting boards. You want to wash the cutting boards between the uh, each produce that, or product that you are using. And if you're marinating, you need to marinate safely. And that, that is in the refrigerator. When you cook something, you want to make sure that you're cooking it in particular meat it um, at the correct temperature. So it's very handy to use a food thermometer. Uh, 
I use one all the time. Uh, the battery just died in mine and I haven't had a chance to replace it. So I tried to use it yesterday and I was, what am I, what am I do? How do I know that it's, it's correct? My temperature is good. So I've gotten so used to it that have not being able to use it kind of shocked me. Um, so no matter how you're cooking, whether you're doing it in the kitchen, on the stove or in the oven, on a barbecue or in the microwave, you want to make it to the correct temperature. You want it to be safe. You don't want to make people sick. And then chilling. We don't want to um, put something that's really hot in the refrigerator because it's going to take a long time for that refrigerator to cool that down. And that will affect all the, the things that are already in your refrigerator. So you want to keep your refrigerator at 40 or lower. Uh, mine is at 39. It's just a degree, but I feel better that way. Um, we want to make sure that we refrigerate our foods within two hours of eating. And we want to thaw foods properly. So throwing that uh, pound of hamburger on the counter uh, to thaw and then going to work and being gone all day is not a safe way to thaw because the that's going to get warm that's going to make the uh, bacteria grow and that could very easily make your family sick so i just want you to be very careful and aware of the foods that you eat how to handle them correctly and safely for your family um, and remember we are talking about canning today Safe canning starts with a safe recipe. So we, we recommend that you always use tested science-based recipes and methods from reliable sources. Uh, if you see a recipe on um, the uh, uh, social media, that doesn't mean that it is a safe science-based recipe. Uh, a few years ago, in our local newspaper, in the cooking section, there was an article. Uh, I don't remember what it was that they were uh, canning, but the recommendation was for you to, instead of can it after you put the hot uh, product in a uh, jar, they just turn the jar upside down, which is not a safe way to can anything. Uh, they got lots of uh, letters from master food preservers and uh, we didn't have that problem again. So uh, we just want people to be safe. Um, is there, are there any questions or? Um, I haven't seen any so far. Okay, all right. I, I think, is there anything I've missed, Linda? Um, well, I think if it will, maybe we'll remember it if, as we go, but I think we should start with the recipes. Okay. Let's go then back to uh, Linda. Okay. I am up first patience with me as I, we did this before and wait a minute. That's not the one I want. I hit the wrong thing. This is the one I want and I want it to be slideshow, right? Right. Okay. We, none of us do this for a living. So we all have to, uh, <laughs> so we have, we have to uh, get to where. So. Okay. Go, go to I your can't. right. Okay. Down on the bottom, maybe. Yes. There you go. That works. That's the one I use. That's the one. Okay. All right. We'll get rid of the people on the side. Okay. This is all about mustards. That wasn't my first slide. But anyway, to get that, and you're saying, do I want that? 
Well, the one we're going to talk about now is called Oktoberfest Beer Mustard. And um, it has those things in it. So let's see if I can go to the next slide. No. I have to do it that way. Okay. You need these things. Can you see the whole slide, everybody? Can yes, ma'am. So you can see the uh, ingredients? Yes. Okay, good. All right. So you got to find beer. Well, I don't drink alcohol in the first place, and I don't drink beer, obviously. And so I stood there in Trader Joe's trying to figure out what beer to buy. And this young man came in. He looked like he was a UOP student. And... Um, I asked for his advice. And so he gave me advice and I I only needed one can of beer. So I, uh, but they, on the recipe, they say, pick a beer that you would like to drink with your, your bratwurst. So uh, that would be what my advice was. If you have a beer that you like, pick, pick that beer. The rest of the things you need, you can see here, We need you need some brown sugar, you need some water, you need some brown mustard seeds. Some brown mustard seeds are sometimes hard to find in the store. I bought three pounds of them, I think it was, on the internet. You can buy them in small amounts, but you need a cup. And so, and then you need malt vinegar and some dry mustard and some onion powder. So, that's what you need in the way of ingredients. And one of the things we always talk about is make sure you have everything you need before you start. Because it's a really big pain in the patoot if you get about halfway through and find out you're missing the onion powder. Because now you have to stop and go to the store and get the onion powder. And that's not really a good thing to do. You also want to make sure you have all your equipment. Okay, so you start off. And I had a smaller stainless steel and you really when you're doing things that involve vinegar you want to have stainless steel because um you don't want to have a reaction and the vinegar will have a reaction with um ferrous materials and with the aluminum so in order to have none of that interference you want stainless steel or glass pots to use and that's what the brown mustard seeds look like they are a little smaller than the yellow mustard seeds. And this is a key um, part of this process. Because one time when we were doing a class, I don't think the mustard seeds got to marinate long enough. And the mustard turned out very bumpy. And kind of hard and bumpy. And that is not what you want. So when you have your mustard and your brown mustard seeds, you bring it to a really good boil. Make sure it's boiling all the way across before you turn it off. And then you put the lid on and wait and wait and wait. The recipe says two hours. It doesn't hurt if it goes longer, um, but you really want to make sure that you have plenty of opportunity for all of that liquid to absorb into the mustard seeds. So um, wait. While you're waiting, you can get your, your can or kettle ready to go. And this is a good time for me to talk about the two kinds of can or kettles we use. One of them is the one you see there, and that is a steam canner. And if, let's see, if you're going to just try one thing and you don't know whether you're really going to like preserving all the time, you don't need to buy any special equipment. You can make a water bath counter out of a big pot. If you have a big pot and you make a and you have a water bath canner or a big pot, you can turn it into a water bath canner. What did I do with my cake thing? Okay. I hid it from myself. Um if you have any pot that is deep enough that you can put whatever size jar you're going to be canning in it and cover it with water above the top. And below it, you can make a rack that your um, jars sit on, either out of a, a cake cooling rack 
that will fit in the bottom, or you can take the some extras of the rings that are the part of the two part lids that we use, and you can tie them together with um, wire ties, like comes on bread packages, or if you happen to have a spaghetti pot. I have a spaghetti pot and I used that for a really long time because it has a liner that is a, a strainer. And so you can put your jars inside that. You have water all the way around all your jars and you cover the top. And then when you want to lift it, you can just lift it right out and get your jars out. Um, and I would recommend if you are new to this and you're not sure you actually want to do it to try one of those methods rather than go buy something. If you go buy something, the water bath canner, I have seen them for about 20 bucks. If you go to garage sales, you can often find them for much cheaper than that. And if you, the steam canners, I haven't seen those much in garage sales so far because they're fairly new. They are more expensive, but if you do a lot of canning, they're really worth the money because you have a whole lot less water that you use. They're not as heavy to carry and much they come up to to temperature faster so after and while you're preparing you're getting your jars hot and if your recipe calls for processing something for less than 10 minutes you need to sterilize your jars which would be 10 minutes if your recipe is going to have you process for 10 minutes well you'll take care of the sterilization in your processing so a blender or a food processor is a really important thing. I don't think you could do this recipe without it. And you really have to run it a lot to get all the bumps out. And it still will be bumpy when you are done. And so that's that part of that. And then once you get all the bumps out, you will put it in your stainless steel pan, add the other ingredients, and cook. So you bring it up to temperature and you stir it constantly. And I would like for this thing to get out of my way so I can read. Anyway, so you want to bring it up to temp. You want to cook it and make less of it. And when you have gotten to about the right place, it should look like that. And as you can see, that is well cooked because when I pulled the spoon across, the uh, canyon that I made stayed stayed there. And I think it took a little longer than the 15 minutes it said. And you want to be stirring the whole time because you don't burnt mustard. I don't think that appeals to anybody. So once you have your hot mustard, you get it into your jars. You put your two-part lids on. And you before you put the lid on, you want to take a... You can see that hasn't been cleaned off yet. You can see the stuff on the side of the jar. So you're going to clean off the top. You want to bring it up. It I think it says one quarter inch headspace. And headspace is the distance between the top of the mustard and the bottom of the lid. And so that would be about where my mess is there would be about a quarter inch down. And so that when that one needs a little more mustard in it, and then it needs to be cleaned off before the lid goes on. And once you have the lids on and finger tight, and finger tight doesn't mean, it doesn't mean, it means old lady finger tight. <laughs> okay, not, not six foot young man finger tight, but old lady finger tight. And um, then you put it in the canner to process it. That's what a water bath canner looks like. And it has a um, rack that is inside you put set the jars on top of the rack and the rack lifts it off the bottom of the pants so you want water to be able to be all around the jars no matter what when you have processed it and you wait until it comes to a boil the whole thing is boiling before you start counting time when it's all boiling then you put the lid on and you have the lid on before that but when you get to there you put the lid on you and you run the canner for 10 minutes. When you get through with the 10 minutes, you turn off the fire and remove the canner lid and wait five minutes. The reason you wait five minutes is everything in that canner is still busy boiling for a little bit. There's still, the water is still moving. 
And you, once you create the seal on your jars, you do not want to mess with that seal. You want to treat it like the delicate thing it is while it's still hot. So you wait five minutes and everything settles down. And after everything has settled down, then you can remove your jars and put them to side. If you are using a steam canner, it looks like that. And I, these are, the mustards go into four ounce jars. This is not something that you would, <laughs> I can't imagine anybody putting up a quart of mustard. You would, you want it in a small jar because you're going to be using it in small amounts. So the difference between the two is when you finish process time with the water bath, you leave the lid on. No, you take the lid off. Somebody should smack me up alongside the head. You take the lid off with the water bath with the steam canner, you leave it on and let it settle. And when it has had the amount of time, then you can take the lid off. Okay, one of the things that we have learned about mustards is that they take, they can start off kind of sharp. And they're best if you wait about three, three weeks or so to, before you want to use them, because then they have a chance for the flavors to blend and mellow. And there are some trusted resources. And any of those places you can find recipes that you can use without any problem whatsoever and know that you will be safe. And now we will go to questions and let me see if I can get back to stop screen share. Okay. And I was going to show you. Is it? Are you seeing me, Colleen? Anybody? I see you. You see me. Okay. I was going to hold up for my camera what the mustard looks like and see after mm -hmm. it's processed, it, it's, it's something that you could spread easily on a sandwich or a bratwurst. I think this is destined for bratwurst because we're having an event at a club I belong to, and somebody is going to be doing bratwurst for Oktoberfest. So I'm going to give him some jars of mustard to use for Oktoberfest. Okay, <laughs> did we did we have questions? I I don't see any questions. Anybody, um, if you have questions, had... you can put them in the chat, and we'll try to answer them. Right. Okay. I I did answer. There was a question about getting the slides and I let them know that the, a link to the presentation will be sent to everyone. Right. And the recipes will be available. Yes. Okay. But it doesn't, it doesn't happen instantaneously. The, um, the recording that we do of the zoom meeting has to get edited and then uploaded. So don't expect to see it tomorrow because it won't, it won't be there tomorrow. Yeah. Okay. Um, Oh, can you use, uh, I think you probably could use an enamel Dutch oven if you don't have a stainless steel pot. Uh, yes, I, I did see that on, uh, one of my recipes, stainless steel or enameled. Yeah. Okay. And I bought. I bought the mustard seeds I used and the yellow ones that I that I bought for another recipe. Um, I bought them on the internet. You can find them in stores. Um, the brown mustard seeds are harder to find, and um, yellow mustard seeds are what are found more. And if you need a large quantity, you know, when you go into the grocery store or a regular supermarket. Usually they're selling you mustard seeds in about a three ounce jar or something. And that's not going to be enough. If you're trying to make mustard, you're going to need a bigger quantity. And the places where you can usually find those are in uh, restaurant supply stores. If you go to a restaurant supply kind of store, um, you will probably find a larger quantity or you can buy it on the internet. It's, it's good to make sure when you're looking at these things that you're paying attention to what size container you're getting because um i think when i was buying the yellow mustard seed it worked out to it was about five dollars a pound when i bought a large bag but it was oh 
$20 a pound if you were buying it in smaller size containers. So pay attention when you're ordering to make sure that you're getting the amount you need. And I think um, there may be some variations, but I think it was about a cup and a half per pound is about what the uh, volume is. So if you're looking at a recipe and you need a cup and a half, you're going to need at least a pound of mustard seed. Okay, let's see. All right. Any other questions? Um, talk Indian, Indian grocery Indian, stores. Indians grocery stores. That's probably true. And probably maybe Asian stores too. I'm not sure. Right. Um, Did you say to remove canner lid after boiling and then wait five minutes or wait five minutes after boiling stops to remove canner lid? Um, no, with the canner lid, with the, with the water bath canner, you take the lid off as soon as you turn off the fire. So when you finish the processing time, you take the lid off and you let it sit for five minutes. And that five minutes is to allow all the bubbling that's going on inside the jars and outside the jars to settle. Um, with the steam canner, you leave the lid on and wait at least five minutes before you take the top off. Because if you take the top off really quick with a steam canner, you lose all the heat really fast and that's not good either. You could break jars probably doing that. So you want to let it cool down, settle down before you take that lid off. So that's the only confusing thing. But if you buy one, the manufacturer's instructions are very good. Follow those. And if you get one of the if you get one of the recipes, they tell you how to use it. So and those trusted sources on the National Center for Home Food Preservation, this so easy to pre preserve, all of those things give you step by step how to uh, use a water bath canner, how to use a steam canner. You can't go wrong if you follow the directions. OK, how do you can you impact heat or spice by the temperature of the soaking liquid? I don't think so. I think what is affected more is how much, how long it takes for the liquid to penetrate into the seed so that it's soft enough to, to be blended and cook. Can you? Okay. Oh, yes. Yeah, somebody mentioned a, a, a store that has high, has volume things and those, yeah. those are probably good. Um, hmm. does the age of the mustard seed impact their ability to soak up liquids? Um, I don't think so. I don't think it's that, although what I think might have made a difference is if you didn't have the right temperature, if you didn't bring it up to a boil in all of these recipes, um, that we have, if you look at it, this this one had you boil the seeds and the vinegar. Other recipes have you boil the vinegar and then put it on the seeds. Um, and I think the biggest thing that we're shooting for there is actually getting through the whole seed with the with the with the vinegar. And um, and I think you know it. They hold their flavor for a long, long time. But I think if you kept them, probably. I'm sure one or two years would be just fine. But if you were like 10 or 15 years, might not have much mustard flavor left in those seeds. Um, all right. I think that's it for, for me for now. Colleen, do you want to talk about your mustard? Okay. Let me get my video up. Okay. Um, I'm, I made a ginger garlic mustard, and I want to admit that I am a plain old yellow mustard kind of gal. That's my favorite. Um, but I made this, this uh, ginger garlic uh, twice, and I will talk about that as I go through my PowerPoint. Um, I did want to say that I was able to purchase eight ounces, an eight ounce bottle of um, mustard seed at, a, if you live close to Lockford, California, the grocery store there 
has their own um, brand of different uh, spices and they all come in an eight ounce container. Um, something else that I wanted to talk about and I'll, I'll do that as I'm doing my PowerPoint. Uh, so let me share my screen. Dot. Share. There we, there we go. Come on. Whoops. You have to put the pointer on there to make it work. <laughs> I don't know. Okay. Okay. So let me, I don't know why I'm here. Um, let me, let me get rid of this. Let's see. If That's I can probably not the right PowerPoint. I'm trying to go back here. Let's start all over. Up at the top. Yeah. There we go. There we go. Okay. There we go. Um, this is what I made the uh, ginger garlic uh, PowerPoint, uh, PowerPoint mustard. It tastes very much. To me, it tastes very much like um, some brown mustards that uh, my husband used to like a lot. Uh, like I said, I'm a yellow mustard kind of gal. Uh, my food safety, I've already talked about that. So I'm going to go through that real quick. And I have the same picture, I believe, that Linda does on heating my jars. Now, anytime you are canning something, if it processes for 10 minutes or more, you do not need to sterilize your jars. You do need to make sure they are heated and they are clean, but you don't need to sterilize them. Uh, this is the ingredients that uh, my mustard has and it's water. Uh, coarsely grated ginger, peeled ginger root, chopped garlic, black peppercorns, yellow mustard seed, brown mustard seed, uh, cider vinegar, soy sauce, dry mustard, and granulated sugar. I made this twice, which I mentioned before. And I got partway through the first time. And... I learned something before the accident happened. So the one thing I learned, <laughs> <She's>, <laughs> and I will tell you. By the way, you, let's just to avoid concern. She's uninjured. Yeah, un uninjured. There was just a mess. So, no injury accident. <laughs> so this is what your ingredients look like. It takes a lot of ginger, um, some garlic, uh, the, the dried mustard, water, vinegar. Uh, I did not have the brown mustard seed. So I made mine both times with just the yellow mustard seed. Um, so this is where I want to talk about briefly about the, the ginger. The first time I made the ginger, I very diligently peeled it all. And then I took my small grater and I grated it and was very careful to not grate my knuckles, even though that did happen a little bit. Uh, I chopped up my, my uh, garlic and I crushed my peppercorns and cooked them in water and this is where I am straining this from the liquid that I am going to then soak my mustard seed in. Um, I learned, what I learned from this process was because I am removing the ginger the second time I did it, I didn't peel it. I put it in my food processor the, with a grater and I grated it up 
and in the in the large large grate. I put it in the water with my uh, garlic and my peppercorns because. I decided I didn't need to peel what wasn't going to be in the final product anyway. Uh, that was a lot shorter amount of time. And I had, I could taste no difference. So I would recommend that if you want to make this, um, I would dispense with peeling the ginger. I was able to buy some large pieces. So I just stuck it through my um, food processor and it worked fine. Um, I, would, I would do that again. So I put this, I put the water, the ginger root, the garlic and the peppercorn in, in my pan. I brought it to a boil, boiled it gently for five minutes and then I strained it. Uh, originally, I strained it not back into the pan, but because it's going to sit for several hours, I just strained it into a bowl. And I let it sit for, it said for two hours, I let it sit for about three. So this is what it looks, what the, uh, the uh, mustard seed looks like as it's sitting in my liquid. This was pretty uh, close to when I added them together. As it sat, it, I had no liquid left in my container. It was just the mustard seed. The second time I made the, the uh, got to this part, I let it sit overnight. And it didn't seem to matter how long I let it sit, whether it was for the two hours or three hours or overnight, I still had no liquid left in my container. Another that's, thing I- That's good. Yeah, it was, it, it worked out the same. So that's something There's, I wanted- There was to... a question, Colleen, that I I <laughs> haven't made this, so or I haven't made it in a long time, so I don't remember. Um, the question was, this person finds ginger hot to the taste. Was the- is this mustard a hot mustard, a spicy hot mustard? No, let me, let me, let me taste it. One of the things that no. I will note is the recipe calls, this recipe calls for a um, half a cup of coarsely grated uh, peeled ginger root. And one of the things that I have found that makes a big difference on recipes that call for grated ginger is if you pack the cup, you get a different amount of heat than you do if you loosely fill the cup. Yes. And so if you, if you, it says a half a cup and it's, you, you just sort of let it fall in the cup. You won't, it won't be as hot as it would be as if you grated a whole bunch of it and you shoved it in the cup. So uh, I packed the cup because uh, I, that's how much ginger I had. And especially the second time I made it, because putting it through the food processor, it was so much easier uh, that I I uh, grated up more unintentionally. But no, this is not. Uh, it's not not it's spicy not, hot. It's not spicy hot. It's okay. like um, my husband loved uh, what is it? Gluten's brown mustard. And to me, it's very similar to that. And I, and I like ginger. So, uh, but I, I don't, it's not overpowering. It's not spicy hot. Okay. Um, so this is a picture of the hydrated mustard seed after it sat for, this is the one that sat for about three hours. Um, you can tell that there's no liquid there. It's all all the mustard seed. So I had the same, it looked the same when I did it for overnight. I mean, it's not going to hydrate anymore if there's no liquid. Uh, 
So then I, I put it into a blender that I have already added the cider vinegar and the soy sauce. And the reason I put that in first is because the liquid helps move the mustard seed around. And I have a picture here of me blending it. You blend it until it is the, um, the mustard seed has become what you want it to be. Do you want it to be more grainy or do you want it to uh, be a little smoother? Mine is a little smoother than probably some people would want, but that's something that you can control. Uh, I did this in my blender instead of my food processor because I wanted to make sure that the blade um, got all of the mustard seed. And sometimes if something small is underneath the blade action on my food processor, it doesn't grind it up as well. <laughs> Having said that, the first time I made the, this mustard, this is how far I got. I got to the blending part. I had set it on my blender on the counter. I poured in my uh, mustard and my um, vinegar and soy sauce. And I turned it on and turned my back. And I heard this clunk. And I turned back and I had mustard all over the floor. And let me tell you this, these little seeds are not easy to clean up because they roll away. Uh, what happened was I had not tightened the, the, the container onto my uh, blender. So it just flew off and I had mustard everywhere. Um, so that, that, was, that was my first experience with making the, the mustard. So I, I would say to make sure that your blender is tightened on to the container and you won't get this, this issue that I had. I will say that it made my kitchen smell very good. <laughs> uh, I kept... You know, because it, it didn't dissipate right away. And plus, I left it in the garbage. I didn't empty my garbage immediately. But it made my kitchen smell really nice. The the cedar or the uh, cider vinegar and, and the mustard, it, it really, I must say, I did enjoy that. So as I'm going along with my second batch, this is a picture of adding the dry mustard and the sugar to the pan with the blended mustard seed. And you can tell that my mustard seed kind of looks like oatmeal. That's yeah, the good. consistency. Um, it was very thick. And I, I wasn't quite sure if it was supposed to be because you're supposed to boil this. Um, my concern was... I'm not, it's, how's it going to boil? But I stirred it con constantly at first because this has sugar in it and it doesn't have much moisture. And I was afraid it was going to perhaps scorch. The recipe also said to uh, stir constantly. So I did that. I didn't have any trouble. Pretty soon I had uh, air bubbles coming up. And then I turned my temperature down and I continued cooking it. Uh, I think it was for five minutes. One of the things I've noticed, Colleen, is when you're uh, boiling something that's very thick like that, they boil sort of like those mud pots that you see in Yosemite and stuff. I mean, uh, yes, Yellowstone. And yeah. you um, get the air bubbles. Right. And you need that's why you have to keep stirring, because when they plop, they will explode bell material hot material hot material yeah. <laughs> so. so then I, I went on and i filled my jars and i just used a uh, a big 
serving spoon to fill my jars. Uh, these four ounce jars aren't very big and uh, my product was nice and thick. So I didn't need to, there was nothing to pour. Uh, the thing I did notice is that because it is so thick, you need to take extra time to get the air out of your containers. So I usually use a chopstick and I, I did a lot of, you can see a lot of the holes there where I have, have moved my chopstick around. And then I uh, used my headspace tool to get my quarter inch. Um, using a headspace tool is not something that you have to do. Um, if you look at the jar top and you see the uh, ridges where your uh, rings go on, you will notice that they meet, that they, they come together uh, one on top of the other. If you measure from that spot, a quarter inch is the bottom of the top ring. So it's, it's the bottom of this part right here. So if you don't have a headspace tool, just keep that in mind. Uh, here's my, my jars and a steamer. Um, process them for 10 minutes so I didn't need to sterilize my jar. That's at sea level, so you need to be aware of your altitude and make changes accordingly. After they processed, I left the uh, lid on my steam canner for five minutes. I think actually my steam canner instruction said three, but I left, I always leave it on for five because that's what my water bath canner is. And then I put them somewhere so they are undisturbed for 12 to 24 hours. Uh, here is my steam canner and a picture of the uh, temperature gauge that's on top. And the red has to be in the green area before you start timing your processing. Uh, this is a water bath canner. Obviously, uh, this is strawberry jam and not uh, my mustard. So you leave your jars undisturbed for 12 to 24 hours. You check the seals. Uh, you take the rings off uh, and wipe your jars down. My, for some reason, mine seem to be very sticky around the rings. Um, you label your jars, what's inside, and you date it, either the date it was canned or used by date. Um, Linda's and my mustard, I don't think you would be able to tell the difference in the flavor. So you want to make sure if that you label that correctly uh, with what you <laughs> can. <laughs> yeah. Uh, here is some um, ways to use the mustard. Um, I did the roast the other night. It was a pork roast. I actually did it last night. And uh, I baked it with the mustard on top, and it was excellent. Um, I, I was really happy with it made a nice crust, gave it a little bit of flavor. It was great. Uh, you can use it as gifts, it, it make little jars of it. Um, and there's some other, other choices there that you can, can use. Uh, here's some more reliable sources. Linda had the same ones. I do want to say that um, I, for, for the dry mustard, it used almost an entire container of dry mustard, the larger one. Um, so just think of that if you're going to make this, that uh, you're going to need a, a whole container of it. Um, I was trying to think if there was anything else 
Nope, I gotta stop my share. Um, We've had a question I, here, and I think I think I can answer this. Somebody asked, "What's the shelf life?" Okay. One of the things we always tell people that you should plan on using things by a one year time. And that's because most of the things that people put up, whether it's uh, fruits or vegetables, either one, you're going to have another supply next year. And so you would want to can the amount you would use in a year and then do next year's. And so you'll have um, the best quality always. And I did once uh, and I have I have done again, sometimes I make lots of jelly. And one time I opened a jar of elderberry jelly that I had just made, a jar that was about a year old and a jar that was two or three years old and put a spoonful of the jelly on a, on a white paper plate so that you could look at it. And you could see the difference between uh, the jellies, the one that was brand new, stood up and was beautiful purple and, and looked like a jewel and was wonderful. The one that was about a year old, pretty much the same thing, but had wasn't quite as firm, wasn't quite as pretty. And the one that was two or three years old had started to um, lose some of its quality. It was brown and it had and it it had uh, some runniness to it. And I'm sure it was still safe to eat, but it, the quality went down. When it comes to a thing like mustard, it's it's probably a little bit longer than that, but it's best to do it's best to do the one year thing because what what you really lose more than anything i think is the quality and quality will deteriorate over time so that is a that's a thing to keep keep in mind so i mean you know obviously and we do get phone calls from people who for whatever reason are cleaning out somebody's basement or garage or something and they find things that have um um been sitting in a jar on a shelf for 15 or 20 years and no i wouldn't eat any of those things so let's see um oops okay i well I'm, I'm, are I'm, you, I'm are you putting the amounts in for people i i was going to do that but i think i'll just read them off I think that's good because there are 10 of them. Yes. Yes. Um, it takes a, a cup and a half of water and a half cup of coarsely grated peeled ginger root. And once again, that's if you pack it, it'll be more gingery. Right. Uh, two tablespoons of chopped garlic. And one teaspoon of cracked black peppercorns. Somebody's asking if you can go back and put it in the um, in the slide deck. I can. I imagine. Well, I, think, I think you could go back to that one slide that you had the yeah. list of ingredients, and you could just put the the amount. Let me. Ladies, you I you talk and I'll Linda, put the amounts in. Linda Colleen. This yes. is Sherida. Hi, it's Sherida. Um, I'm gonna be putting it on our website. Okay. Uh, our I, recipes on the on right. the web. I sent okay. you the I sent you the one for the Oktoberfest. I yeah. So it and I can send this other one today. Okay, so to those who want the actual recipe, you you'll have it. When, when will you be putting it on the website, Sherida? I'll try to get to it um, by tomorrow. Okay. So close, soon you'll be yeah. able to, to do it. I, I, I did want to say, because uh, there was the question about, let me make myself visible here. There was a question about the age of the mustard seeds. So the first jar of mustard seed I had uh the price was $3.99 <laughs> the, the new one that I bought because I had the explosion the price was $4.99 
-hmm. Now, tasting as I went along after the mustard seed had rehydrated, they tasted the same. Mm. I didn't notice any difference in the potency. And I would say that the older jar was probably three years old. Yeah. I, th you know, I'm, 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 this is not, I research space as far as I know. I'm just, my experience is mustard seed seems to last a long time. Many other spices lose their potency faster, but mustard seed is one of those that kind of kind of hangs on to it i don't think it, i don't think it goes bad particularly right i think probably because um, it has such a hard shell on it i and i did want to say uh about the shelf life and linda was correct we recommend a year uh but um ball panning jars says um uh, 18 months Okay. So, and a lot depends on where, you know, one of the things for all of our canned foods, they're really meant to be stored in conditioned space. And what that means is either inside the house, they're not supposed to be subjected to the 110 degrees in the garage. Um, most of us in California don't have basements a basement is a really good place to keep things because it it's more temperature controlled but um so condition space means if that you keep it somewhere in a place where you would be comfortable and and then with all of these things um air and light add to it's losing its uh quality over time so temperature air and light are things that you want to avoid when you want your your stuff to stay good for a long time. So think about think about that when you're storing. Many people would go put these things in the garage, including me, at different times in my life, just simply because of space. But um, it's not not the best place for it. Right. Um, um, yes, yeah, somebody. Go ahead. What uh, there's a question here, and it's a very good question. Um. Commercially canned foods normally have a longer shelf life than one year. And that is true. What's the difference is people who are canning things in, commercially and putting them in cans or jars commercially can't have access to processes and machinery that home cooks do not have. And so you, you wouldn't be able to replicate the conditions. You wouldn't be able to replicate the even the most careful person could not replicate the sanitation levels that you can have in a commercial food processing plant. And so um, it's, and sometimes that stuff that goes in the can has other things with it that we aren't putting in there because we want to know, we want to be able to pronounce the items that we put in the jar. And, <laughs> and if you look at, if you look at uh, canned food and, some of it says what it is and you can pronounce every word, but there's a, I know I've looked at a lot of cans that had many syllable words that I wasn't sure how to pronounce, which means that they were not something that grew on a vine or um, came up from the ground or, or something else. They were manufactured some, some other way. Um, let's see. Are there any other questions? Higher temperature, higher pressure. They have all of those things, which we do not have. Right. And um, I, I would say that I would make my my ginger garlic mustard again. Okay. So, um, <clears throat> and, and I'm a yellow mustard girl. So uh, I thought of this the, was really uh, good. Of the other mustard recipes that we might eventually get, on our thing, the one that I liked the best of all the ones I've made is the cranberry mustard. And I would have done that, except I didn't couldn't find any cranberries at this time of year. So we're getting soon to cranberries, but not just yet. Speaking of cranberries, our Master Food Preserver in-person class 
<laughs> that will be on the third Saturday of October will be gifts from the kitchen. And we will be doing lemon ginger marmalade and cranberry chutney. And my rules, when I when I pick gifts from the kitchen products, I have rules. We have we have savory and we have sweet. And then it must look pretty in the jar. It has to be something that I think is really good and it needs to look pretty in the jar. And the lemon ginger marmalade looks really pretty in the jar. And seeing as I find myself making several batches of it every year, it must be really good. And the same thing goes for the cranberry chutney. So um, the those that class will be advertised um, soon and it will be a limited number of people. It'll be uh, 12 people. So if you're interested in coming to an in-person class, that will be the one in October. And then I think the November one is also in person and I believe it's going to be on apples. So, um, and we we're trying to figure out how we can manage to do both an in-person and a Zoom each month, but we are a small group. So we are doing, right now we are doing what we can. But we yeah. certainly appreciate all of our attendees. All of our people joining us. And let's see, where did I went? Let me go back up to the top. We had people from Sacramento and we have master gardeners from San Joaquin County and Watsonville and Woodland and Modesto and Denver, Colorado. Woo-hoo! <laughs> and a former, former MFP that moved to Denver and somebody in Grangeville, Idaho and Capitola. Oh, lucky person. You get to live over on the ocean, New Jersey, and more Sacramento. Deer Island, Oregon. That sounds like a really neat place. San Francisco, Elk Grove. So we had we had a wide sampling, but no, no Yellowknife Northwest. I hope the people in Yellowknife Northwest Territories are okay. So and we have a raised hand. And what? Chris Hayes, what what do you want to tell us, Chris? I'm not sure. How do I got to find Chris Hayes? Pay, bear with me. Okay, okay, you're unmuted, Chris. Did you have a question? My question again is about the mustard seeds and the quality of those. I, I just, how could, are they dated on the jars like things are supposed to be that you can get uh, a feeling I, for that? I don't know. Hang on. I'll go get the bag of mine. Uh, yes. My, my, uh, my is dated. Let's see. I bought this last week and it best used by. July of 2027. Okay. Do you so have that's, a... That's four have, years. And I don't know how long it sat on the shelf. Yeah. Do you date things, spices, when you buy them? If you buy them from uh, like uh, Mediterranean grocery stores, they are not dated. Do you go ahead and date things? I mean, how do you know when to toss stuff? Well, I don't usually date them. Um okay. Especially if it's something I use a lot of. And I I always kind of give it a, a sniff if it if a I sniff not, and a taste. Yeah. If it's, it's not, not gonna not, it's not gonna go bad from spoilage to make you sick, it's going to lose its potency. Okay. You know, when you're talking about a dried thing, which most spices are dried, the th the things we do as master food preservers to make things safe is we add vinegar to it. Or we add sugar to it. Vinegar and sugar both bind with the water in the product and make it unavailable to bacteria. So we, we work in a clean environment. We process it to kill anything that's in there. And then we bind up chemically the water. And, and, and lemon juice, Linda. And well, and the lemon yeah. juice is, yeah, it's acid, acid. Like, like the vinegar. So that's how we're making... That's the process is making it safe when it's um, things like jellies or jams or fruit that we're doing. When we do vegetables, which are low acid things, 
then the way you do those is if you're going to put it in a jar and it's going to look like the vegetable, um, you're going to do it in a pressure canner and you're going to, that's going to raise the temperature and raise the pressure that it's canned under, which will make the botulism will kill the botulism. And then other things that we do to make food safe is we take away the water. So we can take away the water by freezing because once it's frozen, it's not available to bacteria because it can't, can't move. And another way is to dry things. Well, almost all of your spices, except for those that are like vanilla, which comes in a, a medium of alcohol, um, we have dried spices. So what the spice is not going to go bad and be unsafe. If it goes bad, it's not going to have the flavor that you expect. Does that make sense? Yeah, it does. Thank you very much. Okay, and my bag of brown mustard seeds says best see it says best buy best buy used by sell by are all different things and they're sort of flexible um <laughs> this this one says 9 15 of 2024 okay okay i would bet money that it would still be good for quite a while longer than that well, uh, I don't know if you heard my jar said yeah. 727. So, and did it say yes buy, best buy, or it use It says buy? best buy. Yeah. See, best. what does best buy mean? It means that they say that the flavor will be what you thought it was going to be until that date. Okay. That's what, we, that's what that means. Yeah. Okay. So, Great. Thank you. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Anybody else? We have, let me go down to the bottom of the chat. I I don't see anything. We have a, a couple more people here. We're glad to uh, have everybody join us. And we have a, a Los Angeles person who used to be an MFP and is now a master. Colleen and I are in our group, we have, what do we have, two? We have two that are not both. Yes. The rest of our group is, we we wear two badges. <laughs> Master gardeners and master food preservers, yes. Right. Okay. <clears throat> Unless we have some more questions, I don't see any more. Oh, are there more types than yellow and brown? Yeah, there's black. Uh -huh. I didn't buy any, but there's black. I, I saw black. I, and what makes the difference? I do not know. I think the yellow seeds seem to be bigger than the brown seeds. When I when I was looking at them, the brown seeds are kind of little. So, mm. I I have a few darker seeds in my jar of yellow. Uh, but it's probably just they were darker on the on the vine or the yeah. Plant. I'm gonna bring I'm a, will bring my brown seeds because if any any of my master food preserver friends wants to do something, I really I really don't need this size bag. <laughs> but they're gluten free. <laughs> <laughs> yes, they are. <laughs> okay. So unless anybody has any other questions, which I'm not seeing any other questions, I think that we are pretty much done for today. So I um, want to thank you all. Um, got a couple more questions here. Well, that's, yeah. Somebody's recommending a place that where they, and we know. Um, I have not our, seen. A Our recipe. mustard recipes are all fancy ones. The ones yes. that that I have seen so far are the Oktoberfest uh, brown one, the cranberry one, the ginger garlic that uh, Colleen talked about, and the other one that I have made that I really liked is a lemon sage wine mustard. But um, I haven't seen one for just... just let's put it this way. If you, if you want French's, go to the store. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's a lot less work 
<laughs> I, I, um, I, I would definitely recommend trying some uh, mustard recipes. It doesn't make that much. And um, there's bound to be somebody you know who will like the different flavors. Right. And you can, uh, you can take it to um, potlucks and stuff like that and, and it'll disappear if whether they like it or not everybody will take a little bit and have an empty <laughs> jar so <laughs> i plan to do i plan to donate some of my my jars i made to the guy that's going to be doing the uh bratwurst on on for oktoberfest at, at, at and i i i already have a few people that want a jar of my mustard so oh well that's I, good i i intend to make another batch yeah the uh somebody asked about a sweet one and the the two that are the sweetest of the ones we did are the two that we didn't talk about, which is the lemon sage wine one and the, the cranberry. I liked the cranberry one a lot. It was really good with um, turkey sandwiches. And speaking of, I happen to like cranberry a lot and the cranberry chutney that I'm going to be doing for the in-person class next month, it is absolutely fantastic on turkey sandwiches. Mm -hmm. It's good on other kinds of sandwiches too, but it's fantastic on turkey sandwiches and um, takes the place of mayonnaise, which is, um, and I'm, I don't know the calorie count, but it's got to be less than mayonnaise. Yeah. <laughs> so anyway, I think that's it. Well, one more thing. <laughs> yeah. Not... You thought of something else? Yes. This, okay. is the, this is the saucepan I made uh, my mustard in. So it's not very big. It's um, two quarts. So you don't need a big saucepan. I put this over here to show you earlier and I forgot about it. But um, I, I use um, a big skillet that's about four inches deep for all my stuff because it hmm. makes one, it's the right size for most batches of jelly and stuff. <laughs> but the other thing is it makes it really easy to take a picture. Yes. Uh, and we we have become the people who take pictures of all the things we cook. Every stage of the cooking so that we can make PowerPoints. What do you do for what do you do for fun? Oh, I don't know. I cook stuff and take pictures of it. <laughs> anyway, I think it's time for me to go out and be a gardener. <laughs> <laughs> i'm not not seeing anything more so i'm thinking yeah. i'll say goodbye to everybody and thank you for coming and and look look at the places where you looked um we shared it and marcy tried to do a good job of getting our stuff out there so that you know what what we're up to so thank you so much thank you